Hello and welcome to Weather Snap. It's Friday, the 3rd of November. I'm Alex Deakin. And I'm Aidan McGiven. This week has been dominated by Storm Kiron, and so will this podcast. But we do also have a great interview about AI and a new and exciting partnership. Yes, we'll have more on that later on. But let's deal with uh, the storm that's been battering parts of the UK over recent days. It's been the big talking point uh, meteorologically throughout the week. It itself has now headed out into the North Sea, although still feeding plenty of showers into parts of eastern Scotland. There are still warnings in place. We'll talk a little bit about where it came from in a moment. But First, let's deal with something that's been a bit tricky through the week, Aidan, and the, the pronunciation of the name of this storm. It's something that's close to your heart. Yeah, the second big talking point, something that has <laughs> brought a lot of amusement in the comments, I think, from all sorts of different people. And I've been following those comments. A lot of people saying, this guy doesn't know how to pronounce Kieran. Now, for the record, I do know how to pronounce Kieran because my brother is called Kieran. So I've been talking about Kieran my entire life. However, his name does not have a father, which is an accent on the second A, and this storm does, which, in theory, creates a different sound. It uh, tends to elongate the vowel sound, and so rather than Kieran, it's Kieron. Having said that, of course, uh, although my mother's Irish, she's the one who taught me about this, she speaks Irish, I grew up in Wales. I've lived in England and Scotland for half my life now. So no matter how I pronounce it, no matter how much I know the theory, it's going to sound clumsy and awkward with my accent anyway. <laughs> uh, well, I th you've done a very good job, a much better job than I have all week. I've been really struggling with it a little bit, but thank you for your input on that. I think we, I think we got it, we got it nailed by the by the end of it as well. So yes, a little bit about the the naming and why it wasn't because we did get a lot of comments about why they can't pronounce. Uh, Kieran, because particularly on TikTok, didn't we? A lot, of, a lot of that. But um, I think we got to the bottom of it in the end. Um, it has been a story that's that's gone on all week, though. We we named this storm last Sunday, so you know the real impacts were felt on Thursday. So kind of five days ahead, this storm was named, and then we've been tracking it all week. You know, you and I have been have been on this throughout the week. It's been really interesting to see how it's developed. But it really didn't develop, did it, until kind of Wednesday. I mean, we named it on Sunday when it was just a, barely even an area of low pressure. But what was going on in the United States was really important because they had a, a cold plunge, so a lot of cold air drifting south, and that invigorated the jet stream. And then a really active jet stream developed and picked up this low, initially just turning it into a fairly standard low. But what happened on Tuesday night, really, and into Wednesday morning, the jet buckled, the low pressure crossed the jet stream. And as it crossed onto the cold side of the jet stream, it, it underwent explosive cyclogenesis. We've talked about that on the podcast before. We've talked about it in deep dives on our YouTube channel. And that's where the, the central pressure drops by at least 24 hectopascals or millibars in 24 hours. If that happens, if, if the central pressure drops by 24 hectopascals uh, in 24 hours, then you can say explosive cyclogenesis has happened. Another term for it is a weather bomb. That's kind of a, a slangy term, but it's a, it's a genuine weather term for, for when these big deepness happen. It's all to do with the interaction with the jet stream. And that's what happened to Storm Kiron on Wednesday morning way out to the west. Well, not way out to the west, but, but a couple hundred miles out to the west of the UK. And that's what intensified it. And that's what really picked it up during the first part of Wednesday. It then kind of reached maturity just before it reached the UK. So it's probably at its deepest or not far off at its deepest as it as it crossed the southwest of the UK. Uh, and before kind of easing a little bit in terms of its intensity as it actually crossed the, uh, crossed the southern counties of England during Thursday before now heading out into the North Sea, still an area of low pressure, as I said, still feeding heavy showers into parts of eastern Scotland. But the main effects from the storm have thankfully now eased. But there were some pretty significant impacts, Aidan. Yeah, and one important thing to mention with Storm Kiron was that as it deepened rapidly, there was a very narrow swathe of really quite extreme winds associated with it on its southern flank. And during the days leading up to Storm Kiron, we were monitoring where this narrow swathe of very damaging, destructive winds would end up. And different computer models were saying slightly different things. They were all saying roughly the same track, but 
really slight variations in that track mm. were leading to huge differences for specific locations in terms of their wind speed because the winds would typically go from five miles an hour near the center of the low to 80 or 90 miles an hour, 20, 30 miles to the south of the low. And so the track of Storm Kieron was crucial in terms of forecasting exactly where the most disruption, the most damage would occur. Now, as it happened, the UK was spared the very worst of the impacts. Yeah, we had some disruption as it turned increasingly wet and windy from the southwest on Wednesday evening. There were some big waves. There were some strong winds, particularly around coastal parts of southwest England. A parked car in Sidmouth was swept into the sea. Uh, thankfully, no one was in the car at the time, so no one was hurt. Mm. But just shows the power. I, I saw on the Sidmouth webcam the power of those waves coming in over the seafront. Mm really dangerous conditions and this is this is what we're talking about when we talk about you know yellow warnings amber warnings about staying away from coasts because you know 50 60 70 mile per hour wind gusts around coastal areas can be so much more dangerous compared with a residential area in the middle of a city you just go back to that Sidmouth point. You and I know that that part of the world very well. It's not far from us at all here. We regularly go to those beaches there. My daughter came came running out the living room this morning because she was she was Sidmouth is on the telly, Danny, and, and the waves were just incredible, just battering what you know often is uh, her place where she goes and builds sandcastles. It was uh, it was really quite stark. Yeah, and after that happens, you often find pebbles on the on the seafront or the road. <laughs> yeah. That yeah. runs along the seafront, don't you? Because they just get yeah. hurled over. So it just shows how dangerous it can be. And the wet and windy weather then swept east. Now, for uh, southern coastal counties of the UK, where the strongest wind gusts were, we had 75, 76, 77 uh, miles an hour around southwestern coasts, so Devon, the City Isles, exposed parts of Cornwall and so on through the early hours. And then into Thursday morning, I think the gust peaked around 9 a.m. in Kent, Langdon Bay. 78 miles an hour. So it was around that coastal swathe where the strongest wind gusts were. Inland, it was 50, 60 mile per hour wind gusts. But as I say, we were spared the very mm. worst because just to the south of that, over the English Channel and across northern France and the Channel Islands, conditions were truly extreme. And I'm not exaggerating when I talk about truly extreme conditions. First of all, the wind gusts picked up, the heavy rain arrived into the Channel Islands and northern France. And then as the low got closer to the Channel Islands, and it's this rapidly deepening area of low pressure, you've got this tremendous amount of air being sucked up from the surface. Mm. So we've got these rising, violently rising air currents. But in addition to that, the wind, as you climb higher in the atmosphere, is changing direction, changing height. So that helps to spin these mm. violently rising air currents. And what you get and what looks likely to have happened across the Channel Islands, and in fact, we saw similar for the south coast of England are these violent thunderstorms and possibly supercell thunderstorms. So these rotating thunderstorms that can, and what we saw in Channel Islands, deliver frequent lightning, large hail, more than two inches in diameter mm. around midnight for Jersey, and reports of a possible tornado. It looks likely from video footage that there was a tornado, difficult to see because it's so dark, and then from the damage as well on the ground it looks likely that there was a tornado. People are talking about their cars being picked up and hurled a few meters. So truly exceptional weather. And that was even before the strongest winds arrived because it was mm. after the low passed that this swathe of really scary winds moved in. Hurricane force sustained winds for Northern France and the Channel Islands for a time during early Thursday morning and wind gusts in excess of 100 miles an hour for parts of Northern France and according to Jersey Met, Channel Islands as well. Really, really bad, like you say, extreme. And um, just a crucial thing there with the, is the position of the low. Now, we could have seen something similar to that if the low had been just a little bit further north and difference of 20, 30 miles. And, and of course, that kind of spawns. You say, well, why didn't you get that exactly right? And the part of that is to do with what I talked about earlier, that explosive cyclogenesis, that rapid development of the storm didn't happen until... 24 hours ago so that's such an energetic process that it's you know it's very hard to model that to within that kind of exact area to really nail exactly where those winds are going to be but yes yeah, certainly the Channel Islands and northern france took the worst of storm kiron in terms of its wind strength but actually in terms of the pressure well the low itself
itself actually tracked across southern England and it, it set a new record for the lowest mean sea level pressure recorded in England. And also Wales recorded its lowest uh, mean sea level pressure for November. Both of these records are for November. So we got down to 953.3 hectopascals in Plymouth and uh, 958.3. 0.5 hectopascals in St. Athen in Wales, a previous record 959.7 in uh, England and 962.7 in 2010 in Wales. So we've beaten those uh, records for November for England and Wales. Not the record for the UK, that remains unbroken. That was set in Scotland back in 1877 with a value of 939.7 hectopascals. So, yeah, just a, a remarkable area of low pressure, but it just goes to show it's not exactly where the centre goes. The strongest winds are, like you said, just further south across the Channel. That's where the strongest winds were into northern France and the Channel Isles. But if you were making yourself a cup of tea early on Thursday morning, you might have noticed mm. that low pressure because <laughs> at that low pressure, tea boils or water boils at a lower temperature, 97, 98 Celsius or something. And so that can impact the flavour of your tea, supposedly. I'm not and I, I wouldn't know. <laughs> Do you not drink tea? No, coffee addict. I knew you drank a lot of coffee, but I didn't realise you <laughs> drink tea. Well, there you go. Learn something new every day on this podcast. Um, and yeah, so saving a bit of energy as well there with it. <laughs> uh, so it's you know it's not it's not all bad from Storm Kiro. Uh, OK, we'll talk about what's happening in a moment because it's a big weekend. It's bonfire night on uh, Sunday and there'll be a lot of fireworks on Friday night and Saturday night as well. So a lot of people have a lot of plans. Um, so we'll get up the forecast from you in just a moment, uh, Aidan. But first of all, something else that happened this week. It wasn't all about the storm. The UK held the first ever international summit on artificial intelligence safety. It was at the iconic Bletchley Park. And linked to that, also the Met Office announced a really exciting partnership with the Turing Institute. Uh, so earlier this week, Claire Nazir caught up with Professor Kirsteen Dale. How long has the Met Office used AI in weather forecasting? Well, data science, and that includes AI and machine learning, they're very much not new. Um, the Met Office has always been a data science organisation and it, it collects, produces, stores, analyzes, and extracts meaning from vast quantities of data. And big data is our every day at the Met Office. So we have 215 billion observations coming in every day. We run 3 million lines of model code. We're used to dealing with vast quantities of data. And data science, AI and machine learning help us with that. So it's something that we're already familiar with. What's exciting about the partnership that we're talking about today is that it marks the next step in our use of AI. It's the next step down the road. What's the main reason AI is becoming an integral part of weather and climate? Well, the really exciting thing about AI is that it's very fast. And I don't just mean a little fast. It's tens of thousands of times faster than running a traditional physics-based model. And because it's faster, that means we can make better use of observations because there's no time lag between the observations coming in and when you run the model. It also means that you can issue a forecast faster, which means that it's more relevant to the weather that you're experiencing at that moment. So it helps you make the forecast better and more relevant and to get them to the people who need them when they need them. So a new exciting partnership with the Alan Turing Institute. What are you learning from each other and combined, what does that mean? Numerical weather prediction, we started in the 1950s. We had the first computer run for operational numerical weather prediction was about 1965. And since then, it's been gaining pace, you know, as the models have become more complex, the computers have been more capable, we've had more data. Well, now the Allen Turing Institute is the UK's National Institute for Data Science and AI. And together, we're bringing together this really exciting new community of meteorologists with atmospheric physicists, with data scientists and AI experts. And we're creating this new community. And this new community is going to be a fresh pair of eyes on what's been called a 60-year-old problem. So they will be looking at how can we deploy this exciting, transformative new science to improve our weather forecast. So it's a really exciting day for us, and I'm delighted to be launching the partnership. Professor Kirstine Dale there. 
OK, let's look ahead then. What's the weather going to be like over the weekend, Aidan? Thankfully, a lot less stormy. Not entirely fine and dry. There will still be areas of low pressure close to the UK. There'll still be some breezy and wet weather, but nothing like what some places experienced with Storm Kieron. That's now moving through. The weather's staying blustery for Friday and the weekend. For many, it's a mix of bright spells and showers. At first on Friday, of course, there's some persistent wet weather to get rid of from northeast Scotland. But then the focus switches to the west. And more especially at the start of Saturday, the southwest, a band of rain moves in from the Atlantic. It's going to bring a strengthening breeze and some persistent wet weather. But like I say, nothing on the scale of Storm Curon. That rain then eases across central parts during Saturday afternoon. Scotland and Northern Ireland seeing a largely fine day, one or two showers, but otherwise plenty of bright spells. And then for Saturday night, if you've got bonfire plans, there's a big event near where we live in Ottery St. Mary, the tar barrels, famous flaming tar barrels. Very famous. Yeah, are you going? Uh, I might pop my head around the corner. I can see it from my bedroom, actually. So I might watch from the safety of the house. If and... you don't know what we're talking about, then if you don't know what we're talking about, then then Google it. Ottery St. Mary tar barrels. It's uh, it's it's a it's a slightly crazy thing. But um, yeah, you won't believe your eyes. Not to be missed. It is legendary. And thankfully, I think the weather should mostly be fine for Ottery and for many other places. There'll still be some showers coming into mainly western parts of the UK, but they'll be moving through in between clear spells. The driest weather will be towards the east. Sunday then for bonfire night itself. Similar conditions. We've still got no pressure nearby, but again, it's clear spells and showers, so there'll be plenty of fine weather away from any Fleeting downpours and plenty of opportunities for bonfire nights and fireworks displays to go ahead. Excellent stuff. I'm not that optimistic for uh, the pitches for my children's football games this weekend. It's been a very wet week and I suspect they may well be waterlogged still. But nevertheless, there'll be some fine weather to enjoy this weekend. So make the most of it. Do stay up to date with the very latest Met Office weather warnings. But that's it from Weather Snap. So thanks for joining us uh, and we'll see you again soon. Goodbye. Bye bye. Another great weather snap, Claire. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to hit subscribe. Then you catch all of our daily weathers on YouTube as well. And if podcasts are your thing, check out our Met Office podcast channel. Lots of information, lots of stories there. And we'll see you again next week.